Hello again, rail fans. Well, the crisp air of fall has come to Central Florida, and I couldn't be happier about it. Now, I got a lot of email and a lot of comments uh, uh, last week after we put up that uh, Bone Valley show, Trains of the Bone Valley. A lot of positive uh, uh, comments about that. So I set about to uh, digging out another old show that is one of my absolute favorites. It was uh, the third show that I did. It's um, about Jacksonville, about CSX operations in Jacksonville. And uh, this was 1999 at this point, and I decided uh, that I wanted to try to get into the inner workings of CSX in Jacksonville, which, uh, as many of you know, is the hub uh, of railroading for the state of Florida. So I set about to try to get into some of these uh, operations in Jacksonville. I uh, contacted a man that I'd already uh, made an acquaintance with, Gary Cease, who was the uh, vice president of public relations, and I started nagging Gary about uh, trying to get into some of these places. And, and over the period of months, he finally, I guess, got tired of my phone calls and letters and said, okay, come on, we'll uh, let you into some of these places. So uh, I appreciate Gary Cease finally, uh, finally letting us get into these uh, places in Jacksonville. So this is 1999, still pre-9/11. So the security, the the fears, the uh, the sense of caution wasn't there yet. So we were lucky in that respect. So in this show, we're going to show you four Jacksonville yards that we got into. The, the four four main yards in Jacksonville. We are also going to go inside the very last operating interlocking tower in the state of Florida, Beaver Street Tower. Um, in its very last days of operation, we finally got permission to go there one week before they demolished the thing and uh, made it all remote control. We're going to take you inside the CSX Dispatching Center um, in West Jacksonville, the Dufford Transportation Center, the, uh, the revered round building. We're also going to get a look inside uh, Amtrak Jacksonville. Uh, and their road railer operation. Now that was still going strong back then and we were able to get in there and show how those uh, trains are put together, those road railer freights uh, on the backs of uh, Jacksonville. And we're going to show you a, a hot spot just north of the Florida Georgia line, um, a little place that's become dear to my heart and uh, honestly my favorite rail fanning place uh, anywhere, Folkestone, Georgia. So. Uh, Sit back for the next uh, 45 minutes or so and take a look at Jacksonville CSX Gateway to Florida. This is Beaver Street Interlocking. Three railroads come together here to exchange traffic, to deliver goods, to get to the bustling market called Florida. This is the very center of one of the busiest railroading cities in the South. The city is not in the center of Florida. It is not even logistically convenient, but it is the front door of the state's freight business, especially for railroads. Early settlers came to the spot because of the St. Johns River which offered access to both the Atlantic Ocean and the interior of Florida. The railroads followed, big systems buying up little ones, resulting in four major roads at the turn of the last century. Henry Flagler's Florida East Coast, Henry Plant's Savannah, Florida and Western, the Georgia Southern and Florida, and the Florida Central and Peninsula were all the backbone of Florida's late 19th century economic boom. The FEC is still the FEC, the GSNF became the Southern and now Norfolk Southern, and the plant and FCP systems became Atlantic Coastline and Seaboard Airline, and finally what is now CSX, Jacksonville's major railroad player. When the Chessy and Seaboard systems merged to form CSX in the 1980s, it was quickly decided to headquarter the new company in Jacksonville's Seaboard System building. Who wouldn't want to have their company's general offices in the warm sunshine of Florida? At the heart of CSX's operations in Jacksonville are its four big yards. 
Moncrief, the former Atlantic Coastline Yard, is the main terminal. Situated just north of downtown, it handles most of the traffic coming through the area. Duval, west of town, is a newer intermodal facility. Baldwin is the old seaboard airline yard and handles mostly automobile, coal, and phosphate traffic to and from South Florida. And Export is the flat switching yard for much of the city's port traffic. Combined, the Jacksonville Terminal is a big operation. This is the Florida Gateway, yes. Uh, we feed, like I say, the Orlando, Tampa area uh, with Moncrief and, and Baldwin. And we probably interchange with the FEC 200 cars a day uh, that they take down uh, on their railroad uh, to Miami. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a hot spot, really. We have a lot of automobile business that comes into Jacksonville. We probably spot, on average, 50 loads of automobiles a day for General Motors, uh, Daimler Chrysler, Ford, and then Toyota has a southeastern eastern distributorship down in Talleyrand. So they get quite a lot of automobiles in as well that we, we give the Talleyrand Railroad down at Export. In the Talleyrand area, port traffic is actually handled on the docks by the tiny Talleyrand Terminal Railroad. Operated by the Genesee and Wyoming Railroad, the industrial line interchanges cars with both CSX and Norfolk Southern at F&J Junction Yard and delivers them to waterfront customers about a mile away. Fans of switch engines like the Talleyrand for its collection of vintage switchers. Adjacent to the Talleyrand docks is CSX's Export Yard. This is a relatively small flat yard, but handles all of CSX's port traffic for the Talleyrand docks. Automobiles, forestry products, corn syrup, and phosphate materials are major commodities through this terminal. A few miles west of the port area is CSX's Duval Yard. Now ask a railroad employee where Duval is and you may get a funny look. Then ask where Jack's ramp is, and they'll point you right here. Jacksonville is a hub for U.S. mail, many big trucking firms, and United Parcel Service. In the late 70s, piggyback traffic became too much for the conventional yards, so CSX predecessor Seaboard Coastline built Duval. The yard connects on the south with the Seaboard Tallahassee Line, and on the north to the Atlantic Coastline Nahunta Sub to Savannah and Waycross. Employees call it Jack's ramp, but the practice of loading piggyback flat cars on ramps ended years ago. These giant loaders do the work now, lifting truck trailers and containers on and off flat cars, one about every 45 seconds. The yard averages 21,000 lifts per month. Every afternoon, UPS trains leave Duval in all directions. These are among the hottest, most time-sensitive trains on CSX. Jacksonville may be the one place where CSX is still in the passenger business. Over behind the op center where the CSX operations center is, is our office call facility and we're responsible for that. 
they've got their own mechanical and locomotive employees, but we see that the trains get in and out, and that's you know that's a big responsibility as well. When you got uh, vice presidents and and such making trips. For CSX Brass looking over new territory or salespeople hoping to impress customers, the office car train is the only way to travel. Eighteen miles due west of downtown Jacksonville is Baldwin Yard. Baldwin is on the ex-seaboard main to the peninsula of Florida. In its day, Baldwin handled all of the hot seaboard freights in and out of South Florida, including huge blocks of reefer cars carrying fruits and vegetables, giant unit phosphate trains, and about a dozen passenger trains every day. There's still a lot of traffic through this flat switching yard, confined now to mostly automobile, coal, and phosphate traffic. The most interesting landmark at Baldwin is the interlocking tower just north of the yard. The tower has long been abandoned, but the lines are still extremely busy. It's curious why the intersection of two major Florida rail lines and a big yard are all located in this spot so far from the city of Jacksonville. They're here because these two lines, when built, were on their way to someplace else. The very first railroads in what's now Jacksonville, which of course is all of du Duval County, were the Florida Railroad, which crossed the western part of the county on its way from Fernandina to Cedar Key, and the Florida Atlantic and Gulf Central. The Florida Atlantic and Gulf Central was built as a combined effort with another company building eastward from Tallahassee. They would meet at Lake City around 1860. The person pushing the FA and CG was Dr. Abel Seymour Baldwin. And when his road crossed the Florida Railroad at a little place western part of Duval County, they named it Baldwin in his honor. After the turn of the century, the Seaboard Airline gained control of both roads. Subsequently, the town of Baldwin and the massive Baldwin Yard grew around this wilderness crossing. The center of the Jacks Terminal is back in Jacksonville, Moncrief Yard. It served a critical purpose on the Atlantic Coastline system, handling traffic to and from South Florida. And 100 years later, its purpose remains the same. Moncrief is at the southern end of CSX's Nahata Sub, part of which is among the busiest trackage on the entire railroad. You'll see part of that later on. Moncrief suffers from the same growing pains as other old yards on the system. Tracks and turnouts not designed for today's longer cars, not always enough room for big unit trains, and urban growth closing in. Another obstacle we've got here in Jacksonville is, just south of us here, right under Beaver Street, Highway 90, we've got an interlocking that we, uh, we share with the Norfolk Southern and the Florida East Coast Railroad. And any train leaving here going south or the bald one has to go through that interlock. We figured we averaged 87 moves through that, op that interlocking a day. Amtrak train 92, the Silver Star, is pulling through that interlocking now, coming around the curve and under a signal called Duke's Crossing. Duke's is part of the busiest junction in Jacksonville. All day and all night, the radio crackles with trains calling at Honeymoon Y, McQuaid Street, and Seminole Connection all part of the Beaver Street Tower interlocking plan.
It's here where tracks of the former Atlantic Coastline, Seaboard Airline, Florida East Coast Railway, and Norfolk Southern all converge. Trains enter and leave Jacksonville right through here in all directions. The ACL tracks lead north to Waycross and Savannah, and south to Orlando and Tampa. The Norfolk Southern Lines extend north to Valdosta, Georgia, and the X Seaboard Line leads west to Baldwin and on to Tallahassee and New Orleans. Every Florida Amtrak train must pass right over these rails. This is the Auto Train P052 bound for Lorton, Virginia, right outside Washington. Beaver Street Tower itself stood guard over the junction for 80 years. It was a 1919 anachronism in the shadow of modern downtown Jacksonville. But the basic way trains were handled here never changed. It never needed to. Train director Cecil Peacock was on duty here to the last day. We have probably on a first trig, you know, with first shift, like from seven to three, we probably have close to 50 trains through here. Uh, we work basically for uh, all three railroads, F FEC, Southern, and CSX, and they all pay a portion of our salary, and so we, we work well with all of them. The controller board, though ancient, still worked exactly as it was designed. It's an old TC board, but it's very good to work with. This row here control our switches, top row, and the bottom rows are signals. So we would line our routes accordingly with these switches, and then we'd come back and give our signals. 0-91-Amtrak-Engine-Number-76-to-Beaver-Street-Over. You don't have to stand very long anywhere along the Beaver Street Tower area to see all the railroads who own it. The Norfolk Southern is constantly making transfer runs to its Florida partner, the Florida East Coast Railway. A mile south, down the FEC side, is the massive drawbridge that affords Henry Flagler's railroad access across the St. Johns River and to the rest of the world. This is a CSX transfer run headed for FEC's Bowden Yard with intermodal traffic for Miami. Beaver Street Tower has been called the preeminent train watching site in Florida. For sheer numbers and variety, it is hard to beat.
we're relieved here to be going to the dispatchers over at South Point, and they'd be handled from the uh, dispatch center. It's been a real important part of Jacksonville as far as moving traffic. It seems like everyone that comes down here, they, they stay until they either retire or either, uh, in our case, tear the building down. But it's, it does have sentimental value to us. Yes, it does. I hate to see it go. The tower finally did go in September of 1999, just six days after this video was shot. The interlocking tower stood next to the Beaver Street overpass, U.S. Highway 90. The viaduct, built during World War II, had become too small for current traffic needs. The new, wider bridge meant that Beaver Street Tower would have to go. And so it did. The action is still just as busy at Beaver, but where the tower stood, there's now just a signal case called Beaver Street Remote that connects the switches and signals at the interlocking with the Jacksonville Division offices at a building south of town. The Florida dispatchers are there. But nearly everything else on the CSX is connected to this place. This round building in West Jacksonville is the nerve center of the railroad. Inside Jacksonville's Dufford Transportation Center, dispatchers work CSX trackage all across the eastern United States. CSX AP dispatcher here in Jacksonville. Territories call the CNO BNO and Florida business units, the Appalachian, Florence, Atlanta, Nashville, and Jacksonville divisions. At desk after desk in this circular world, there is a quiet intensity. Superintendent of Operations Brock Lucas oversees it all. All but two dispatchers on this entire railroad are here in this center. Uh, we handle like 23 with the Conrail acquisition, probably uh, 28 to 30,000 miles of track, and most of it is done right here in this center. We have uh, a lot of double track up on the former Conrail property. Most of the territory down here is a single track with pass tracks. Q51703 coming by Lipstick. In the fast world of 60 mile an hour freights and 79 mile an hour passenger trains, these operators must know where every train is at every second of every day. All signals, sidings, and junctions are controlled right here in West Jacksonville. This is achieved through a system of microwave, satellite, and fiber optic connections. Still, the two-way radio is the most important communication tool. CSX BC Dispatcher Jack Sanson Emergency Transmission, over. If there are problems in front of the train that the dispatcher needs to tell the train about, he'll call them on the radio. You know, we've got a defective rail, you need to reduce your speed. Sometimes you'll have a train out there and you'll, he'll go the entire trip and you never have to talk to him. Uh, other days you're talking to him continuously. CSX BC Dispatcher Jax W00404 over. Dispatcher Leon Lance works the BC console, handling the former Seaboard Airline main from Savannah, Georgia to Norlina, North Carolina. How close are you to Southern Pines? Over. Leon is giving track authority to a work train delivering cross ties near Southern Pines, North Carolina. He's typical of many of the dispatchers here at Dufford who started their railroad careers with one of CSX's predecessors. In Leon's case, it was the Seaboard Airline. I hired out in Raleigh, so I, this is the only railroad that I've worked in my 37 years out here. It's changed quite a few times in the, in the, over the years with, as far as handling the train, the train orders. And we, had, we had quite a bit of, uh, of uh, telegraphy back in the early 60s up through the about, until about 70. Back then you put out train orders, you might put out 50 or 60 train orders. They run by train orders back in those days. Now it's DTC blocks, which is basically the same, only you give it to them verbally over the, over the radio. Some regions are still run with DTC, or direct traffic control blocks. In this so-called dark territory, there are few signals and fewer power-operated sightings, and the dispatcher still maintains complete control by two-way radio. Dispatcher Richard Boggs' CE desk is only four feet from Leon Lance, but his territory extends 200 miles away. Richard is giving block authority on the former Charleston and Western Carolina Railroad. All right, Mr. Carla Jones, 7866, you have a clear north yes relief from flagging in the Augusta block with instructions to take siding Martinez, dispatcher RWB. 
These dispatchers are responsible for everything that happens on their stretch of the main lines, including any emergencies. CSX C dispatcher Jacksonville calling employee W.M. Fogel over. There's been a reporting of a tree that is down on the track at uh, Bush River Road, over. Boggs is now on the radio with the area's road foreman asking him to check out the trouble. He'll slow down or stop trains and coordinate the maintenance forces until the situation is over. Another one. I'll tell them to call, uh, call Southern. All right, There's thanks. not any other little, little bitty railroad that we play around with up there, is there? No, just a Norfolk Southern up there around Newbury. I don't think we can call them little bitty. No. We said earlier that this dispatch center is round. When it opened in 1988, the Dufford Center had giant video screens all the way around its perimeter walls. Dispatchers and supervisors could see half the room from any vantage point. The seaboard system on one side, the Chessie on the other. But CSX gained more territory, the room had to be scrambled up, and those big screens were expensive to maintain. They were removed and replaced with traditional desktop screens. Not as impressive, but far less costly to operate. Out on the rails of Jacksonville, it's always easy to find a train. One of the hot spots is the Kingsland subdivision, the ex seaboard main line to Savannah, Georgia. CSX cut the line just north of St. Mary's some years ago, but the line is still very busy. Trains traverse the Trout River Bridge all day long. Unit coal to St. John's Power Park, pulpwood and chip hoppers to several area paper mills, and automobiles to Blunt Island Sea Terminal. This is A772, a local that runs from Waycross, Georgia to Fernandina Beach every day. The train and its southbound sister are known as the Fernandina Rockets. This line also hosts another major Jacksonville yard, named for its proximity to one of its major customers. Every day, the choicest hops, rice, and barley malt arrive at this yard, and boxcars loaded with the king of beers go out. This portion of the old seaboard main line was built as the Fernandina and Jacksonville Railroad. Fifteen miles north of the Trout River, it connects with Senator David Ulee's Florida Railroad that once ran from Fernandina to Cedar Key. At that time, the spot was known as Hart's Road, but was later renamed Ulee in honor of the feisty Confederate senator. This structure in downtown Ulee is now a storage building for the nearby rock company, but even with the green asbestos siding, it's unmistakable as a former seaboard depot. A remnant of the old Florida Railroad, the Fernandina Sub still runs from Yulee to Fernandina Beach on Amelia Island. This unusual Florida beach town has tourism and industry living in close quarters. A renovated downtown with little antique shops. And, as in many small towns, the old Seaboard Railroad Station now houses the Chamber of Commerce. Right across the tracks is a classic Florida seafood house. And a quarter mile away, the Rayonier Company turns 40-foot-long pine trees into paper products. And CSX serves the town with its 10-track yard and B-36 switcher. Back down on the south side of Jacksonville on the A-line is McGirt's Creek. A fishing pier right next to the tracks makes an optimal viewing spot to catch Amtrak 91 just leaving town from Miami.
don't look for McGirt's Creek on your Jacksonville maps. That's what it was called originally, but a developer decided that the name didn't have enough class or pizzazz or whatever. So the name was changed to Ortega River. As you might expect, railroaders still use the name McGirt's Creek. The draw span is a Scherzer rolling lift bridge, and tenders leave it in the open position because of all the pleasure boat traffic. It is usually lowered only minutes in advance of a train. This ex-Atlantic coastline Maine to Sanford is not nearly as busy as its northern counterpart, the Nahanta Sub, but there are plenty of scenic spots to see trains. Here, along US 17 South, near St. John's, the line runs right next to the highway. coal train pulling into Yukon siding is getting out of the way for Amtrak 53, the auto train out of Lorton, Virginia. Amtraks take priority everywhere on the CSX. Passenger trains have always been an important part of Jacksonville railroading. It was, and remains, the center of passenger rail travel in Florida. This portico, with its 40-foot high granite columns, was once host to a remarkable amount of passenger traffic. During the height in the 20s, this station served as many as 180 or more trains a day, many of which ran in sections. It wasn't that Jacksonville was a major destination, it was a place where trains were broken up trains would come in here from New York on the coastline and it would be separated into coaches and sleepers going to Tampa, St. Petersburg and Miami all by different routes and each railroad that came in they would schedule all the arrivals about the same time in the morning. The Jacksonville Terminal was completed in 1919 the same year that Beaver Street Tower was built. No longer serving trains the building is now the facade for the prime Osborne Convention Center. Prime Osborne was an Atlantic Coastline lawyer who helped orchestrate the merger of that railroad with the Seaboard Airline. He rose to become the chairman of the Seaboard Coastline and later orchestrated the SCL Chessy merger that formed CSX. Jacksonville on the timetable is now here. The Amtrak station four miles north of the Prime Osborne Center on the CSX A line to Savannah. A run-through station rather than a grand stub-in terminal, Amtrak Jacksonville is a utilitarian facility serving six daily trains and the thrice-weekly Sunset Limited.
1.25 a.m. The southbound Palmetto arrives on the house track to drop off her road railer cars. There's a considerable amount of express freight business in and out of here. Fast mail, frozen seafood, and Bacardi rum all ride north on the backs of Amtrak's silver trains. These lightweight road railer trailers have proven an efficient means of hauling freight on fast long distance trains. Each afternoon, the trailers arrive from customers around the North Florida area. They're backed right over the house track. And attached to these railroad trucks called bogies. A self-contained compressed air system lifts the truck tires up away from the rails. The trailers are coupled up and the little truck train will go on the back of tonight's northbound Silver Star to New York. Dock to dock intermodal service in less than 24 hours. Not bad, even by today's railroading standards. Amtrak's express freight business was conceived to generate revenue for the financially ailing passenger hauler. But critics say that hasn't happened, that the freight cars don't pay for themselves and actually contribute to passenger train delays. So, as Amtrak's new management comes aboard, scenes like the Silver Meteor hauling express freight across the St. Mary's River may fade into history. What will not fade into history anytime soon are the CSX freights which cross this river. This is the busy Nahanta subdivision running from Jacksonville to Savannah. And just across that bridge, on the Georgia side, is one of the most popular train watching spots in the southeast. It's just a real train watcher's paradise because we have so many trains. What, what happens is the train from all segments of Florida that are not going absolutely due west have to come through Folkestone in order to get to the north and to the Midwest. Consequently, we kind of call the Folkestone funnel. If you want to see train traffic, there's no better place than CSX Milepost A602, Folkestone, Georgia. And there's no better person to tell you about it than the town's number one train watcher, Cookie Williams. We have them come from everywhere. Uh, we've had them from England. Uh, there's a gentleman that comes every two years to Folkestone to video and watch the trains. And of course, we have groups from Tallahassee, Florida, and Orlando, Florida, and up in the Carolinas and Virginia, and this is the hot spot. Cookie is a serious rail fan. A retired executive from the town's Union Camp lumber plant, Williams is active in local politics and is a major proponent of Folkestone as a train watcher's mecca. Train watchers are sort of like antique dealers. They, they'll go around and they stop and they'll look and they'll move on to the next place and they'll come. But they always come back. They're looking for a bargain. Well, our bargain is good weather and a lot of trains.
This quiet little Georgia railroad town is situated 40 miles north of Jacksonville, at the top of a unique piece of the CSX system. As they approach Jacksonville from the Midwest and Northeast, CSX lines converge into a 20-mile stretch of double-track railroad through which 90% of Florida-bound train traffic must pass. It's nicknamed the Florida Funnel, and it doesn't take long to see why. We're looking north here. Just beyond the signals and the viaduct is Folkestone Junction. To the left is Waycross and Rice Yard, one of the busiest rail yards in the south. To the right, Savannah, Richmond, and ultimately, New York. Trains like this Q126 Jacksonville to Memphis intermodal blow through here all day and all night. All of Amtrak's daily Florida trains, except the Sunset Limited, come right through here, mostly in the early morning and late evening. This is PO53, the southbound auto train, running late on an early December morning. Foreign power isn't uncommon at Folkestone, since Waycross and Jacksonville see just about everything. Just like in politics or fishing or football, a gathering of train watchers will produce spirited discussions about anything. Cookie and Joe Oates of Tampa regularly get into it. Now the train is the train is four forties train. It might have been four fifty six crew, but that consist that came out of Winston, not Orlando. Now what's uh, what's coming up next? Q four forty. The real four forty is now coming north. The real Q four fifty six is on the way to Waycross. Joe is uh, he's off base this morning, <laughs> right? No. <laughs> hospitality that uh, people extend here is, is just uh, unmatched in my experience so you know couldn't get any better than uh, wonderful railroading wonderful people wonderful location so it's it's a 10. PO 9104 has a medium clear signal track one and Folkestone going to number two main over. <laughs>
train watchers have become so important to the city of Folkestone that in 2001, they constructed a platform specifically for viewing trains. Of course, it was the brainchild of Cookie Williams. Rail fans from all across the South came for the dedication when Folkestone Mayor Dixie McGurn officially opened the facility. Therefore, I, the mayor of the city of Folkestone, Charlton County, Georgia, do hereby declare Saturday, August the 4th, 2001, as Professional Train Watchers Day in Folkestone, Georgia. Spectators got a taste of the area's train watching quality as speeches were interrupted many times. Now just look what we have. We have double main line track. We have flat, visible, one mile vision in each direction. And here we'll pause and say grace for a moment. <laughs> the media man. Folkestone will continue to be a hot spot for train watching because Florida continues to grow. And to get freight into South Florida by rail, you have to go through the Jacksonville Terminal and through here. There were other routes at one time, but they've all been removed. So Jax remains the state's busiest railroading town, the CSX Gateway to Florida. 53, engine 17 south, clear train number one, Folkestone. There is still plenty of other railroading to see in Jacksonville and across the South, and we'll do that in future shows. Things may change as Florida grows and America's railroading industry evolves, but for now, Jacksonville is among the most strategic points on the entire CSX system. Well, we hope you enjoyed this look inside uh, Jacksonville. Again, my thanks to Gary Cease, uh, the now retired uh, Vice President of uh, Public Relations and uh, Public Communications for CSX for getting us into all those places up there. I, I doubt if we could do that today. So uh, thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed our little visit up to Folkestone, Georgia, too. That was uh, the first time I'd ever shot video up there. And I'm glad you got to meet one of my uh, one of my best friends, one of my absolute best rail fanning friends, Cookie Williams. 
the Lord called him home about uh, 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago, and uh, I miss him every time I think about Folkestone or go there. Uh, he was just a one-of-a-kind fellow. Anyway, uh, I hope you liked the video. Hit the like button if you did. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that. Email me if uh, you want to uh, send me any uh, uh, comments uh, at railfandanny at gmail.com. Also, you can put your comments in the comments section below. And uh, pretty soon we're going to get back out there and start showing you more uh, of today's rail fanning. And uh, I hope you look forward to that because I am. Till then, we'll meet up again somewhere out there on the high iron. This is Danny Harmon, out.